is right. <laughs> and what I'll do first is introduce all three of our panelists, beginning with Seba Sarwar, who is joining us uh, via Skype. And she is a writer and multidisciplinary artist and activist currently based in Houston, hence Skype. And she moves between the city of her birth, Karachi, Pakistan, where she spent the first half of her life in a home filled with artists, activists, and educators, and her adopted city of Houston, where she has recreated a community similar to the one where she was raised. Her work tackles women's issues and displacement. Her writings have appeared in anthologies, newspapers, and magazines in Canada, India, Pakistan, and the US. Her video and art installations have been exhibited in Pakistan, Egypt, India, and the US. And she has performed extensively around the US and Pakistan. Through Voices Breaking Boundaries, a grassroots art organization that she has co-founded 14 years ago and where she serves as artistic director, she directs and creates new work for their living room art productions that are partially funded by the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts and the NEA. She is a recipient of three Houston Arts Alliance Creative Awards, is a lifetime member of the Macondo Writers Workshop, is listed on Texas Commission on the Arts Touring Artist roster, and she was honored by the Fatima Jinnah Women's University in Islamabad. In 2012 through 13, she serves as artist in residence for the Mitchell Center for the Arts at the University of Houston. And right here joining me is Chris Eng, and he is a doctoral candidate in English at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York, where his primary research interests include Asian American studies, critical ethnic studies, and queer discourses. At CUNY, he is a co-organizer of the Revolutionizing American Studies Initiative and the Mentoring Future Faculty of Color Project. Chris serves on the board of directors for the Center for Lesbian and Gay Studies, where he chairs the programming committee. His presentation today draws from his larger dissertation project, which is entitled Dislocating Camps on State Power, Queer Aesthetics, and Asian Americanist Critique. And I'm Donatella Galella. I'm a doctoral candidate in theater at the Graduate Center. And my dissertation is a critical history of Arena Stage, the pioneering regional theater at Washington, DC, and its articulations of nonprofit black and American identities. And excerpts from two of my chapters are forthcoming in Continuum, the new African-American performance journal and in theater journal. I currently teach at Eugene Lang College at the New School and I'm the dramaturg in residence for Leviathan Lab. All right, so that being said, I wanted to thank everyone who has helped to organize Kata and especially Juliet for all of her amazing and patient organizing. And shout out to HowlRound, thanks all of you, especially Vijay, who used to be my coworker at Arena Stage. Uh, all right, so I'm going to throw it to Sabah Sarwar and we're going to actually um, hear some comments from her and then watch a video of her TED Talk and then uh, hear some additional comments from her before we move to the more formal papers by Chris and myself. Thank you. Thanks, Donatella, for a great introduction. Hi, everybody. I wish I could be there in person. We tried very hard, and um, everybody, Juliet, and everybody tried just very hard to make it happen. It did not for different reasons, including my mad schedule right now. So I'm just very happy that I can be with you via Skype. Um, my project, What is Home, emanated from a two-year residency at the Mitchell Center for the Arts at the University of Houston. And, but truly, the issues that I explored during my residency have percolated inside me for all my life, actually, whether in the U.S. or Pakistan. Through the residency, I've completed a first draft of an experimental memoir. It includes po prose and poetry, and I'm hoping to add images, and the piece is called What is Home. Same title. And um, I'm now pushing the project into the public sphere through an installation exhibition that I'm planning for spring 2015 um, through another grant award. And what you're about to see is a talk that I gave last October for TEDx Houston. Um, and in this, I talk about the issues that I grapple with every day as I confront the issues of what is home, which is really what you, we are all talking about right now. 
So, uh, with that, I'll, I can answer questions. I'll be, I'll be available for the comments later. And I look forward to what Chris and Donatella have to say. What is home and how we address that issue? In 2013, it's difficult to pin down one simple idea of home and how that word relates to memory, art, history, and social justice. As I work on a new manuscript about those subjects, I find myself reflecting on how, when I was growing up in Karachi, Pakistan, I had no idea what the world would be around me. I did not know that I would have spent almost half my life right here in Houston, Texas, that I would be raising a bicultural, binational child, or that I would be writing, creating art, and community. My parents moved from India to Pakistan, and at that time, there was no, it was all one country. Pakistan was formed in 1947. There was a new border carved, and they moved. Their families moved. I was born in Karachi, Pakistan, and there I attended a British school where we studied all subjects in just English, no indigenous languages, barely any Urdu, the language that my family used. It was only later, much later, after reading textbooks that were passed down, history that was taught to us from British textbooks. It was only later that I learned to challenge mainstream textbooks and form ideas for myself, create community, work on creating art productions through which we could share our multiple truths. In the meantime, of course, I didn't know this growing up in Karachi. I didn't even know that a country such as Brown, a city such as Brownsville, Texas even existed. My husband was growing up, was born in Brownsville, Texas, and he was growing up along the US-Mexico border. At that time, he and his siblings could not speak Spanish, were not allowed to speak Spanish in public schools. He grew up without much fluency in Spanish, a language that is claimed by the US-Mexico border, one that his family knows is theirs. They call themselves Chicano, Chicana, trans-border, which is something that all of us are today. Of course, if we think about it, we cannot today have the time to talk about the world as it is framed by today's geopolitical borders. We cannot talk about the indigenous languages, the indigenous lands and cultures that have been lost. We will stay with just today, and I will say that in some senses, I'm glad that some things have changed since my husband and I were growing up. Today, assimilation is no longer pushed. Personal narratives are appreciated, as you have seen today from all of today's stories. And there is a growing scientific research to prove that children's brains develop much faster if they are exposed to more languages at an early age. Together, my husband and I are raising a nine-year-old Chicana Pakistani born right here in Houston, Texas. She speaks, she is fluent in two languages, Spanish and English, has comprehension in a third, Urdu. One of the first things I did when she was born was to get her a passport. And when she was eight months old, she took a trip with us. And since then, she has made that 24, yes, 24, sometimes 36 hour journey, many, many times over. And I'm now in the process of getting her dual citizenship, just as I have. This past summer, we were in Karachi again, and I asked her, would you like to live here sometime? She was like, sure, that would be cool. I would get to spend more time with Nani, and I'd make a lot more friends. I knew exactly what she was talking about. In Karachi, she gets to have special time with my mother, she adapts very quickly to the different schedule, breakfast at 10, lunch at 2, dinner at 9, and a spate of guests rolling in through our house at all different hours for meals, drinks, tea, whatever happens to be served at that time. But she lacks same-age companionship. That is something she has here in Houston. 
which she has made through the public school that she attends. But every morning when she reports to school, she is greeted with not one, but two pledges of allegiance that are broadcast over the school intercom system. Often, she is asked by a classmate to put her hand on her heart. When I hear these stories from her, I am struck by how much has changed since September 11, 2001. I remember how at that time I was teaching in a Houston public school. And in those days, students did not have to say the pledge if they didn't wish to. No Texas pledge was broadcast. And students were not monitoring each other on patriotism. Of course, when I was growing up in Karachi, we had to learn the national anthem also, but a lot of us joked about it, especially since the lyrics were in Farsi, Persian, which we couldn't understand anyway. <laughs> but there, nationalism is on the rise, just as it, as it is right here in the US and around the world. There is more fear, there is global violence, war, and nations are building wa walls to protect from each other, US against Mexico, India against Bangladesh, Israel against Palestine, just to name a few. Nowadays, I don't teach in the classroom that often. Mostly, I learn from my daughter. So when preparing for today's talk, I was chatting with her and I asked her, would you have liked it if I had married someone from the same country as myself? And she said, no, that would be boring. So I asked her to explain a little bit more. And she said, well, I like coming from, you know, having different histories. I like having more homes. I like being able to travel and learn about the world. And then she looked at me in a very matter of fact way and said, besides Ammi, you're not from one country either. Your parents were born in India. And she knows that when I was a child, my mother took me across the border many times to visit my family's old homes, to meet family on the other side. What would the world look like today if we all together, right here, beginning in this room, pledged allegiance to ending international poverty or providing equal education to all, regardless of national borders? What if we weren't thinking about me, my country, my neighborhood, my city first, and we remembered our roots before these new, very new, geopolitical borders were carved before we had to get passports to cross. And ultimately, what does the question of one home or a single allegiance have to do with social justice, art, and memory? The idea of one home is an old idea. Can you imagine how boring Dorothy's life would have been if she'd never gone to Oz? But somehow, all of us, in all of us, there is that yearning for that special place, home, under the Gulmohor tree where my siblings, cousins, and I sat, waiting for my father to pull up in the driveway in his Mazda after a morning of seeing patients. And then we'd all get summoned into the dining room, buried deep in the recesses of my old house, of our old house, and there, far from the city sounds, of bus horns blaring, pa -pa -ra -pa -ra! or the city or the street vendor calling for recycled papers, Radhya, or my grandmother calling, scolding her maid, Amitum se kaha tha na, and her voice floats down from her balcony down to our back courtyard. Many of these sounds are still in Karachi. Our house has been torn down. My grandmother has long since passed away. What is home? Can anyone truly answer that question of home, a romantic myth that some have let go of, yet some of us hold on to? As artists, perhaps we have to hold on to home because home represents memory, memory shapes our art, and memory and home is our way of revisiting our history, re-examining so we can find truth for ourselves. On one such journey, on one such quest to find truth, I spent some time in Bangladesh this summer, this past summer. Bangladesh was once part of Pakistan. 
I did not learn about Bangladesh in my history textbooks. I did not learn about Operation Searchlight, March 1971, which was launched by the Pakistani army that landed in Dhaka and arrested and killed hundreds and thousands of Bengali activists, intellectuals. That war went on for eight months, many more atrocities, rapes, killings, deaths, and there was silence in Pakistan, and only a few brave souls, artists, poets, activists, had the courage to speak out. That project has become, that the research that I began there has become part of a larger project that I'm working on called Borderlines. Borderlines makes connections between what has been happening in South Asia and the history to connections right here in Houston to neighborhoods such as near Northside, Gulfston, the US-Mexico border, to pull out the stories, to share them, to ask questions like, who does this story belong to? Who, do, who has the right to tell this story? And what is the right layer? There are so many layers to each story we find, and so many amazing artists I, that I'm working with are pulling out these stories. Jimmy Castillo, Autumn Knight, Robert Pruitt, Habib Sandhu, Monica Villarreal, Oscar Sonnen, Jinwen perez Verti, Eric Hester, have all contributed, continue to contribute as our artists from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and from the US-Pakistan border. And we will be sharing this with all of you. All that we are learning, we share with you over the coming year, coming two years, actually. As artists, we are the conscience of society. If we let our memory lapse, there is no history, there is no passion, there is no truth. It's urgent that we share the truths about the world around us, not as messages, but as responses to the pain and joy we experience around us in the world we live. Many have blazed the path before us, Fez and Fez, Patti Smith, Mel Chin, Arundhati Roy, just to name a few, very few. And now, more than ever, it is urgent for us to experience more of the globe than one single place, so no one location is viewed as superior to another. Perhaps further down the road, my daughter will create art to capture her experience of being in Karachi in December 2007 when Benazir Bhutto was assassinated in Rawalpindi, 800 miles away. And she will remember how the city and the country was burning and people died, and how we had to spend the night at my friend Salma's house. And we had to wait for the lull of morning prayer before we could be whisked to my parents' house just a few miles away. Why is it important that my daughter, at age nine, remember the name Benazir Bhutto? Or be with me when I go to cast one of my first votes at J.P. Henderson Elementary on Dismuke Street in Houston, Texas? <coughs> so she can ask questions like, why are there no women presidents in this country? Why are all the streets named after men? And who is that woman who climbs under the bridge under I-45? And where is she today, now that her shopping cart is gone? She could not ask these questions if she did not have multiple realities. The path that my, fa my family and I have chosen is not always easy. Many of you are, who are choosing this path know what I'm talking about. There's a high financial cost. Those journeys are our investment, our college fund investment, so she learns about more than just right here. And there are bigger losses. I was in Houston when my father passed away. It took me two days to get back. It took my daughter and me two days to get back to Karachi during which time the burial had already taken place. And we were in Karachi last summer when someone close to us was diagnosed with a form of cancer and we had to scramble to get back in time for surgery. Being in the middle means I'm constantly comparing spaces. When people mention poverty, I say, where? 
when there's talk of education or women's rights, I'm wondering about the population under discussion. And ultimately, I do know that if more people had families living in Sarajevo, Addis Ababa, Dhaka, Bangkok, or Karachi, we would not condone drone attacks so easily. Sometimes when my daughter has conflicts with friends, I invite her to sit down and do what we are doing today, to listen and to share her truth. There is no guarantee that we will agree with everything that everyone says, but we will understand everyone's worlds better. For that, we have to be curious, empathetic, and we have to put judgment to one side. We are all complicated. Perhaps there would be less fighting, maybe even fewer wars and bombings. In response to a fast-changing world, we must all adapt fast, make sure we listen, document our truths, and bring up the next generation to know as many worlds as possible. Thank you. All right, thank you so very much, Seba. Should we do some Q&A with you now, or we'll wait till the very end of the session? I think we had talked about doing questions at the end. All right, that is what we will do then. So thank I'm you. gonna kill my image so I'm not looming large behind you and listen to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that sounds great. Chris, take it away. Morning, everyone. Um, thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much to John Teller for organizing this panel. Um, <clears throat> so I thought I want to ask how my understandings of home shift when camps are the dwellings that one must inhabit. In yesterday's morning plenary, panelists considered this question in relation to the World War II Japanese American internment camps, pointing toward the tenuousness of being at home for Asian Americans when the legal and cultural parameters of US citizenship has been consistently defined over and against the Asian other. Um, these camps, as discussed yesterday, index displacements from home on multiple levels. Nikkei were forced to abandon their homes as the government confiscated their property, their legal rights and protections as citizens and residents were suspended, um, attorneys were assigned identification numbers and relocated to flimsy barracks in the desert, fenced in by barbed wires and under military watch. Contemplating camps and how they mediate the relationship between Asian Americans and the US, I want to explore what Mia observed yesterday as the trickiness of the word camp. Stratifying between permanence and transient, camps stage struggles over the meanings of the very spaces and bodies that they accommodate, which cannot be easily settled or contained. I suggest that examining and playing with multiple registers of camp can productively illuminate um, how Asian Americans engage in performances of embodied placemaking. As geographers Arjit Sen and Lisa Silverman articulate, embodied placemaking elucidates the ways that space shapes and is shaped by macro political, historical, and eco social economic forces. Um, as Karen Shimakawa has argued, camps signal a spatialization of abjection, assuming national significance in segregating and containing a racial threat from within um, the nation space. Yet embodied placemaking also emphasizes how spaces and bodies are mutually constitutive in creating meaning for one another, gesturing toward the capacities of bodies in negotiating, reworking, and transforming the conditions and spaces that they inhabit. And what follows, I chart three different manifestations of camp to consider how Asian Americans engage with practices of embodied placemaking to contest conditions of impossibility for home within the US nation state. 
Crucial in these contestations, I suggest, are struggles over understandings about the work that Asian American as a category does and the labor that Asian American bodies perform. Camp, one, rigid political or intellectual group formations generally characterized by staunch ideological stances, intellectual naivete, and an unwillingness to compromise. Following the social movements of the 60s and 70s, new structures of home seem to emerge through various group, new groups formed around the label of Asian American, from political organizations to cultural institutions and academic disciplines in universities. Yet recent decades have shown that these homes remain precarious at best. For example, despite the work of their companies specifically dedicated to casting Asian American performers, actors of color are consistently underrepresented in theatrical productions nationwide. Similarly, scholars in Asian American studies um, have found that interdisciplinary programs like ethnic studies remain ghettoized, while the traditional departments that the movements aim to change insist that they are not responsible for analyzing questions of race. Within the times of economic recession, um, during which both universities and uh, cultural institutions suffer budget cuts, Asian Americanists must prove the, work of their, the worth of their existence um, as these groups and the value of their work. Yet, insofar as scholarly and cultural productions around race often explore issues of social inequity and power relations, the work that they do, that we do, often fails to meet the allegedly neutral standards, measures of excellence, productivity, and universality demanded by funding sources. Unable to achieve status as high work that transcendently speaks of a deracinated human condition, our work is dismissed as mere play. According to economic measures, our work, to borrow Saline Wong's terms, is considered extravagant rather than necessary. And similar, we see oftentimes that designations of Asian Americans and different racially specific organizations as camps reflect a general dismissal of work that calls for examinations of race beyond a mere surface level embrace of diversity. Flattening Asian American into purely demographic and bureaucratic terms Institutions deploy the category to add diversity while evacuating it of all historical and political work. In other words, Asian American is made to work for the interests of the institution while any other labor is devalued. Given, given this flattening of Asian American, I want to think about what forms of work the category can still perform um, to critique and remake these conditions of racial labor. Camp two. Architectures of temporary accommodations typically used by soldiers, refugees, prisoners, and or travelers. Um, that's the Oxford, Oxford Dictionary. Um, in addition to Japanese American internment camps, a number of camp formations describe the history of Asians in the US. Even more broadly, scholarship establishes the regularity with which modern nation states use a variety of camps for objectives such as detention, security, labor, death, evacuation, and resettlement, and justified on the basis of necessity, whether as a consequence of natural disaster, profit making, or national security. Um, meanwhile, in camp people, bear varying degrees of criminalization, rightlessness, and confinement as a consequence of these practices. Um, so in my larger um, project, I'm interested in exploring how the management of these different camps come to consolidate um, a mode of Asian racialization that homogenize um, multiple different groups of people from Asia in order to buttress state power and national identity against this racialized population. Um, and I won't be able to really um, talk about this at length or all these different types of camps. Um, <clears throat> but today I'll focus very briefly on thinking about labor camps such as those um, housing Chinese migrant laborers working on the transcontinental railroad, um, which only serve as one particular manifestation of the very complex um, and sometimes contradictory relationship between U.S. state power and Asian racialization. Um, during the gold rush in the 1850s, the Chinese immigrated to California en masse along with many other um, groups, um, propelled in part by famine, the lack of economic opportunities, and political turmoil in China. When the construction for a transcontinental railroad was authorized in the 1860s, the Chinese served as the perfect labor source for a backbreaking work that white workers were reluctant to take on. By 1867, the company employed, um, and this is the Central uh, Pacific Railroad Company, approximately 12,000 Chinese migrants who made up 90% of the labor force. 
Given the relative absence of Chinese migrant laborers from official records, um, fiction and drama has been central to recovering their history. And for the remainder of my talk, I want to consider uh, very briefly um, a few scenes from David Henry Wong's play, The Dance and the Railroad, uh, which was initially commissioned by the New York City Department of Education in 1981 and was recently restaged at the Signature Theater in New York in 2012. Revisiting this historical moment, Huang's play situates us in resistance. During an eight-day strike in 1867, when Chinese laborers refused to work and demanded equal pay to their white counterparts. Removed from the camps, the play takes place on a nearby mountaintop where Long, a 20-year-old Chinese migrant laborer who has been working on the railroad for two years, practices his Peking opera. Ma, a naive 18-year-old who arrived to camp just two months ago, spies on and interrupts Long's practice. He begs Long to teach him the moves of the opera, and in the mentorship that ensues, Ma conveys his idealistic dreams of getting rich from the camps in uh, Gold Mountain, and Long exposes the realities in its exploitative labor conditions. Through these two characters, the play contemplates the ways in which their labors and bodily performances are separated out into work and play, the former seemingly represented by the, the railroad and the latter by the dance. Indeed, Lone practices his art in solitude, detaching himself from the rest of the workers. An idealistic Ma, however, seems to see a linkage between um, Lone's practices of dance and the strike that's occurring um, in the background, observing, quote, that stuff you're doing, it's beautiful. Why don't you do it for the guys at camp? Help us celebrate. Lone dismisses the strike, questioning its very uh, um, effectiveness in changing conditions of work at the camps. Reluctant at first, Lone agrees to teach Ma on the condition that Ma acknowledges that the Chinese laborers are all quote unquote dead men. Projecting camp as the spaces that index their social death as racial labor, Lone points to the deadness of their bodies since they are being purely animated by racial capital. Quote, it's ugly to practice when the mountain has turned your muscles to ice. When my body hurts too much to come here, I look at the other Chinamen and think, they are dead. They, their muscles work only because the white man forces them. The attempts to maximize their labor productivity comes at the expense of the deterioration of their bodies. And here, racial difference mediates the material contradiction and the fantasy for a pure um, free abstract labor. For Lone, the dance represents a reprieve from this deadening. He says, I live because I, because I can still first force my muscles to work for me. However, if Ma's insistence that he just wants to perform may signal a work of play, Lone views his opera as not disconnected from the laboring conditions to which his body is subjected in camp. Instead, he stresses that it is also a form of work that requires discipline of the body. Lone shows that performances of dance are part of the labor of enacting survival strategy, strategy, strategies for managing the deadening labor of the camp system. Insofar as camp seems to illustrate spaces of confinement as presenting totalizing conditions of oppressive violence, I argue that the play gestures toward another mode of camp to underscore the possibility for otherwise. As Lone and Ma's debates around the possibility of allowing the body to perform otherwise, manifest through competing notions of masculinity, their simultaneous desire for and failure to approximate masculine ideals, I argue, register as campiness. Camp three. Known as a subcultural style and strategy of incongruity, parody, playfulness, and theatricality, camp aesthetics is most often associated with practices developed by queers in the US and Europe to manage practicing in the closet. Discussing campiness in relation to Asian American um, raises some concerns. As David Ng has argued, uh, masculinity is a crucial site of contestation for managing the relationship between Asian American men and the US national body politic. The Chinese railroad laborers have been interpreted as exemplifying both the emasculation of Asian American men through restrictive immigration laws that produce bachelor societies and as a masculine ideal that privileges hard physical labor. Hostility toward Chinese migrants based on anxieties of economic competition manifested in a wide circulation of visual imagery that depicted these men as effeminate and asexual, which as we all know um, has had a long enduring legacy. 
In response, a number of literary texts and performances um, have aimed to challenge these stereotypes by reaffirming masculinity. And alongside and in slight contrast to these dominant practices, Huang's play, I suggest, um, points us toward the possibility that campiness has been an important strategy of critical mimesis, as um, Karen Shmikawa discussed yesterday, for Asian American cultural producers. Campiness um, can possibly open up an alternative archive of the practices by which Asian Americans aim to challenge, rewrite, and transform the logics of gender and sexuality that facilitate their objection from US citizenship. In his foundational work on queer of color critique, Jose Esteban Munoz called attention to camp as a practice by racial subjects who identify with oppressive logics of gender and sexuality um, that comes to be reproduced in dominant cultural norms. And camp aesthetics signal practices of resistance enacted by minority groups by inhabiting, inhabiting the stifling spaces and norms in order to challenge them from within. From within these spaces, performances of campiness, I assert, has the potential of mapping what Munoz calls a queer utopianism, which imagines an ideal futurity that simultaneously demands a relentless critique of the present um, conditions that foreclose its realization. And in The Dance and the Railroad, the plays the patient of campiness gestured toward queer utopianism through the opera as Lone and Ma contemplate the possibility for the body to perform otherwise under the system of racial labor, so other than Chinese Kuli. For Ma, he sees the Peking opera as a site to enact his idealistic dreams of returning to China, which rather than um, symbolizing any authentic homeland of return, comes to um, represent this imagined elsewhere of utopia, which is coded in highly masculinized terms. Ma states, by the time I go back to China, I'll ride in gold sedan chairs with 20 wives fanning me all around. With the 20 wives proving the worth of his labor, he also hopes to appropriate the tradition of Peking opera to cast their labor on Golden Mountain, on Gold Ma Mountain, excuse me, in heroic terms. Quote, I'll play Guangdong and tell stories of what life was like on the Gold Mountain. We laid track like soldiers. By insisting upon playing the role of Guangdong, Ma approximates this elsewhere through the masculine heroism of Chinese traditions. And in doing so, he simultaneously reveals his distance from this ideal, given his current position in the camps. Um, I'm running a little low on time, so I'm going to condense some of the reading. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, so in the closing scene, campiness manifests um, in a utopian practice as Lone and Ma and acts out an actual opera. And hearing about the victory of the strike in obtaining demands for a pay increase and decreased working hours, Lone changes his previous skepticism about the effectiveness of strikes. Contextualized within his thoughts about the deadness of the laboring body, the success of the strike causes Lone to see the possibility for agents through, agency through the dance within the labor conditions of the railroad. Subsequently, the victory inspires a blending of the railroad into the dance. And rather than assume the role of Guangdong, which Ma um, long desired, he instead demands that they perform an opera that is specifically written about their experience as a migrant laborer in the US. Quote, so let's do an opera about me. Traditional? Lone, you gotta figure any way I do Guangdong wasn't gonna be traditional anyway. In the staging of a mock heroic drama, Lone and Ma perform it perform an ironic juxtaposition between the supposedly heroic form of the opera and the quotidian story of their travels and travails as migrant workers. Um, so very quickly, um, they use all these different objects from a tin bowl and wooden stick um, to become their gong. Um, <clears throat> they varyingly switch different roles, sometimes playing the different types of racist um, laborers that they encountered. And it's the first time that they really um, parody and assume uh, broken English the whole time they're speaking um, without any Chinese or Oriental accent. And towards the end, there's this very interesting and weird scene where um, they're performing out the labor of like hitting the rocks and then they're doing all these things with each other's bodies and they're like moaning in really suggestive ways. Um, suggestive in a sense that it's like the act of hitting this mountain is sexualized in some way and yet it's um, 
the fact that there's no women, that, like it's a very interesting play on thinking about the erotics and what's happening with the body at that moment. Um, <coughs> and so in addition to resonating with campy practices of appropriating genres and convention, the sequence is imbued with both humor and sorrow, a sense of helplessness and a fire of resistance. Um, <coughs> and campiness comes to not only parody their uh, failure to perform by the necessitated demands of masculinity, but also to critique the ways in which the camp system comes to intimately regulate bodies in terms of its movements, contacts, intimacies, and desires. Um, so skipping ahead, I'll just say that um, these performances illustrate, I think, give us a way to think about how Asian Americans varyingly assert bodily agency through everyday performances of embodied placemaking that actively negotiate and remake the various spaces that we inhabit. And as such, we may see Asian American performance as a capacious site for mapping queer utopianism as home becomes an um, imperative for a persistent critique of the present in order to imagine and materialize a more just future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. That was terrific. All right. A few years ago, I was in the green room, which is what we cleverly call our communal space in the theater department of the PhD program at the Graduate Center at the City University of New York. And I was discussing with a friend the Chinese characters and the yellow face that happens in the Cole Porter musical, Anything Goes. Another colleague overheard us and interrupted us Oh, are you Asian? She asked me, implying that my research interest in Asian slash American studies was principally, if not solely, because of my Asian slash American identity. And as a mixed race person, I became legible only when I publicly talked about Asianness. Instead of broaching my colleagues' presumptions and racial logic, in that moment, I decided to explain my heritage, a demand often made of me, in order to make my passage through this situation easier. I open with this anecdote to foreground how allegedly safe spaces or homes like the green room are sites of contestation, and that I am complicit in their construction and maintenance. In this talk, I will discuss not feeling at home as a theater scholar and spectator through the case study of Anything Goes. I draw from women of color scholarship on the affective dimensions of performance and politics. And as for the musical, I'm interested in my own discomfort, which Karen Shimakawa has brought up, and alienation with the marginalizing of Chinese characters and centering of yellowface performances in contrast with most audiences and musical scholars who feel at ease. Finally, I would like to gesture toward how we can create critical homes of inquiry in the theater and in the academy. The scholarly work of Doreen Kondo and Sarah Ahmed inspire my approach to pleasure, displeasure, and home. In About Face, Performing Race in Fashion and Theater, Doreen Kondo writes, quote, I seek to reclaim pleasure as a site of potential contestation that might engage and at times be coextensive with the critical impulse how we dress, how we move, the music that accompanies our daily activities, and that we create and refashion our engagement with, and not simply the passive consumption of media or commodities do matter and can be included in a repertoire of oppositional strategies. Putting these words into action, Kondo then describes feeling joyful when recognizing herself in a production of Perry Miyake's Dough Ball, as well as feeling indignant when remembering the lukewarm critical reception and contingency of homes for Asian Americans. She is acknowledging that homes emerge from and are built on, upon a field of power, and she writes, the realism of Doball heightened the felt necessity to create homes for ourselves, however problematic and provisional, figuring home not as an essentialized space of identity, but as an historically, culturally specific construct inseparable from power relations. So she has these mixed feelings and a call for critical spaces, and that brings me to Sarah Ahmed's book, The Promise of Happiness, in which she addresses the politics of the imperative to happiness. 
in the book, she points out how happiness can actually obscure power inequalities, and that when you point out such inequalities, you then cause people to be unhappy, and then when you do that, you become the problem, and unhappiness becomes attributed to you. So power is not the problem, the structure is not the problem. So to give you a more concrete example, consider when a woman walks down the street and a man demands that she smile. This demand emerges from patriarchy, and to highlight that structure and refuse to smile often causes the man to become unhappy and then to locate that unhappiness in the woman, who is a troublemaker, a feminist killjoy, rather than in systemic oppression. And so an unhappiness, feeling like you have the wrong response to something, can be very alienating. The sense of feeling out of place and the demand for pleasure or happiness are particularly acute when it comes to musicals, especially revivals, because they are supposed to make you happy. They can conjure up feelings of familiarity and comfort and nostalgia along for a past that never truly existed. In a chapter called After the Golden Age, musicologists Jessica Sternfeld and Elizabeth Woolman urge us to challenge how nostalgia and revisionism in revivals maintain hegemonic conceptions of Americans and US identity. Revivals and their marketing materials often imagine the past as a better, simpler time. This simplification is particularly troubling when conceived as white, heteronormative and bourgeois homogeneity that totally obscures historical and continuing material inequalities. By revising structural oppression or relegating it to the past, revivals can allay contemporary anxieties of privileged audience members. Theorist David Saverin argues that musicals merit study in part because of, quote, the politics of pleasure. No theater form is as single-mindedly devoted to producing pleasure, inspiring spectators to tap their feet, sing along, or otherwise be carried away. This utopian and mimetic dimension of the musical, linked to its relentless reflexivity, makes it into a kind of hothouse for the manufacture of theatrical seduction and the ideological positions to which mass audiences can be seduced. So what he's saying is that pleasure is intersected with popularity, and that often makes elites look down upon musicals, but I would argue that that's precisely why musicals are a productive site of struggle that articulates power structures and why they should be studied. And musical theater scholar Stacey Wolf adds in a manifesto called In Defense of Pleasure, she says, use pleasure as a way in to teach and study musicals, and pleasure motivates. So for me, I subversively question pleasure in other people as a way in, and my displeasure motivates me in my engagement with Anything Goes. So um, we've already brought up this musical this morning, actually, and I'm sure you know it's by Cole Porter, largely. It features two Chinamen who were originally named Ching and Ling in the 1934 Broadway production. Contemporary reviews rarely even mention the existence of these characters and the yellow face that concludes the musical. And I would argue this silencing reproduces a very specific kind of symbolic violence to Asian Americans that obscures structural anti-Asian racism. When scholars do discuss Anything Goes and its politics, they often downplay or again ignore the Asian characters and yellow face. For example, there's a book called Enchanted Evenings, the Broadway musical from Showboat to Sondheim, and Jeffrey Block traces changes to the musical because it's been revised and revived many times, and he argues that all traces of racism are removed. Um, in another article recently, drawn from Mikhail Bakhtin and Michel Foucault, George Burroughs asserts that the ship, it takes place on this cruise ship, of Anything Goes is a carnivalistic heterotopia that offers fertile ground for exploring social differences through a special mode of self-performance that is staged outside of restrictive conventions that operate at home. So such self-performance, however, is the privilege of white protagonists, and they get to sing their own songs and adopt myriad personas on this ship, which is called the SS American, while the Chinese characters barely speak and in 1934, the Chinese Exclusion Act is still in place, and they also don't get any songs to sing. 
So where is a home for these characters? When I searched for production stills for the Roundabout Theater Company's revival in 2011, I found only one image of the Chinese characters played by Andrew Kuo and Raymond J. Lee, and they are way upstage and totally blocked by the ensemble, which is almost all white people. And they don't get to dance. They're standing there while everyone else is tap dancing uh, to Anything Goes. And they actually do get to enter the tap dance after several minutes of that act one closing number. And it's when the protagonist, Reno, welcomes the characters into the ensemble and she presses her hands together and bows to them. And then the melody and the orchestration turns to wood blocks in this orientalist fashion. So the Chinese men dance at the end of the number, but they are permitted to participate only minimally and conditionally. And here I wanna be clear that I'm not critiquing the actors for taking on these roles. I'm just questioning the extent to which the SS American and what it represents constitutes a home for Asian Americans. Instead of further unpacking Ching and Ling here, I would like to focus on the yellow face that concludes the musical. I could not find any images of the yellow face performance from the Roundabout production, probably because Roundabout doesn't want to make those images public. Um, again, that reproduces this obscuring and silencing that I'm talking about. One of the few scholars who did address the yellow face in the musicals, if only very briefly in a couple sentences, is Raymond Knapp, and he wrote, Particularly troubling are the scenes in which Billy, Reno, and Moonface disguise themselves as Chinese quite as if this did not count as racist in the same way as blackface. And as a side note, as we know, social justice activists often compare yellowface to blackface, I think really in order to be taken seriously and to expose the limited black-white binary of US relations and the relative invisibilizing of anti-Asian oppression. So in Anything Goes, toward the end, the Chinese converts lose their cheng sam by gambling and then being physically assaulted. Like they're literally one is hit on the head with a glass bottle and these, by the central implicitly white characters played by white actors. And in the roundabout production, Reno, Billy, and Moonface take their clothes and put them on, which are now haunted by Asian bodies, and they wear dark, glasses and they take on these mincing gates and allegedly Chinese accents amidst Orientalist orchestrations. They enact the white privilege of putting on and taking off racial markers, but without the attendant yellow makeup and taped eyes common in earlier cultural productions. And finally, their convincing yellow face performances is what helps to solve the comic plot and put the correct couples together. When I attended the revival, I found that the audience there roared at the broken English and the exchanges such as, rich man cannot buy Chinese honor, I'll make it 5,000. Chinese honor sold. And the comedy of that relies upon a performance of Yellowface as distinct from a normative white American. And it is in part because of the genre of comedy that allows some to dismiss charges of structural racism in this musical. In so doing, those who take pleasure in the comedy are really placing their feelings over the feelings of other folks, those who feel displeasure, and what that act does is it socially reproduces white supremacy and the silencing of Asian slash American deviance. I'm personally struck by how Yellowface remains in the roundabout production in 2011, despite the many revisions that the libretto has undergone. As scholar Bruce Kerr reminds us, musicals are open texts, and each revision suggests changing US racial formations and discourses. So for example, Ching and Ling have been renamed John and Luke, as if this is necessarily less troubling because the characters now have assimilated names from the Gospels. <laughs> Moreover, the yellow face of this text is barely acknowledged in popular discussion from Broadway to summer camps. And in the moment of performance, many spectators actually find yellow paste ex extremely pleasurable. And it leaves me alienated, and I think many of us here, and we've been talking about this again this morning. So again, I just want to draw our attention to actually most people really like it. And I think that's important to remember. And now I'm going to quote Sharon, Karen Shimakawa. And in National Objection, the Asian American Body on Stage, she provocatively and convincingly argues about Jonathan Price in Miss Saigon that, quote, for a large segment of mainstream Broadway theater audiences, 
Watching a white man in yellow face with taped eyes, blackened teeth, greased hair, and bronze skin is more pleasurable, more comprehensible, and for producers, more profitable than watching an Asian or Asian American male body on stage. So it's utterly important to remember that cultural productions can be problematic and pleasurable at the same time because they emerge from a field of power. And the Academy is not immune, but indeed an institution that participates in, replicates, and sometimes challenges systemic oppression. As I suggested at the start of this talk, I've been thinking critically about Anything Goes for a couple years now, but I was able to present papers on the topic only recently when I organized my own panels. At the Association for Theater and Higher Education conference this past summer, my paper on yellow face and revivals was surprisingly well received. And I say surprisingly, because typically when I present this kind of work critiquing institutional racism and our implications therein, I receive responses that I'm exaggerating material racial inequality, that I have not proven the conservative aspects of racial projects, that I'm being too sensitive or too harsh or too pessimistic. So I will never know if my abstracts for those other conferences that, <laughs> like, were they rejected because they were not good enough, they were not interesting enough, or just didn't fit with other panelists? And how each of those assessments about goodness, interestingness, fit, mm. is shaped by power structures. I would like to end by meditating on feeling pleasure and displeasure to construct homes. Again, Doreen Kondo, she concludes her book about face by calling upon Asian American artists and scholars to use the tools of their trade to authorize their own stories. Quote, theater performance and design have created spaces where Asians and Asian Americans can write our faces, mount institutional interventions, enact emergent identities, refigure utopian possibilities, and construct political subjectivities that might enable us to affect political change. We have many institutional homes from Asian American specific theater companies to Ralph Pena's Facebook wall where artists have critiqued the recent production of the Mikado in Seattle uh, to this very conference where we are doing the labor of representation and redress and often having a lot of fun doing so. At the same time, I think that we need to be mindful of Sarah Ahmed's critique that happiness can obscure material inequality and that actually unhappiness can also bring us together. Quote, there is solidarity in recognizing our alienation from happiness. Even if we do not inhabit the same place as we do not, there can be joy in killing joy. And kill joy we must and we do. In the green room, I navigate microaggressions and feelings of despondency and alienation when my attempts at consciousness raising and diversity faculty and staff and students appear to fail. I leave the green room for the contingent space that is the Mentoring Future Faculty of Color Project, an initiative that my friends, including Chris and colleagues, mostly from the English department, co-founded two years ago. I ask, how do we continue to use pleasure and displeasure to motivate us in the deconstruction and construction of homes? How do we make yellow green rooms? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, let's see if we can get Seba back and start this discussion going. Are there any questions or comments from the audience? We would love to hear your feedback and I feel like we've had a lot of panels in the past couple of days and less discussion time. So I'd love to take advantage of that and hear about what do you think of home and its contingency and our implications therein and the problematic aspects, but also the possibilities. Yes. My fiance's parents are in Miami and her grandmother's in Florence, Italy. 
I live in Philadelphia, and I, I have made this as much of a home as I think I ever will have. Um, but that being said, I will never truly be home. Um, there is no such thing as a physical place marker that I could ever consider to be home, simply because the people, the places, the experiences, and the things that mean so much to me in my life are split between so many nations and cultures. Um, so that being said, you know, the work that I do um, as the director for the Philadelphia Asian American Film Festival has really allowed me to build upon these kinds of ideas and these connections within the Asian Pacific American community because I think that more so than any other community of color in the United States, we have this tremendous diversity of experience amongst what is amazingly called one community, right? Um, the experience of a first-generation South Asian immigrant or a first-generation Cambodian refugee is going to be entirely different than a fourth-generation Japanese or Chinese American's experience. Um, and yet, we're still lumped together as Asian Americans. And that's, that's one thing I think we have to look at from a state perspective and a power structure perspective. But at the same time, I feel more comfortable in Asian American spaces. And I think most other people here would say, regardless of the ethnicity that they come from within that spectrum of Asian Pacific American, that in a room full of Asian Americans, there is this commonality. And maybe that's just simply because of the fact that we all do have such diverse experiences at the margins of society in the United States. So I don't know where to take that. Um, I'll, I'll leave that. Um, and give the mic back to the panelists, but that's my experience on uh, this, this idea of home. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Um, be, being academics in the room, I, I'm interested in it, this is also a continuation of the earlier conversation, of um, a redefinition of what classic is and means, because we often, what I find is classic can be a cover for allowing, you know, this is a classic. It can't be changed, that's what it is. And realizing, A, that cla who determines what a classic is and what that means is one is set up in a structure that is uh, one that excludes us naturally and our artists and our forms and our stories. Um, and that also fixes our portrayals in a certain place and time and moving beyond that. And so I think that's the question a lot of times, is like with the Mikado, it's like, well, this is what this piece is and we can't change it. And what it needs to be is, well, maybe we need to either not do these pieces anymore um, or move the conversation forward in a different way. So I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts about that, because I think that's what, a by a lot of these things being called classics uh, and being known quantities, it allows the kind of the institutional racism a a to continue and perpetuate. Uh, I uh, totally agree with your comment and sentiment about classics and what is th what constitutes the canon, who decides, and then how that is reproduced by who has funding, who has power, who can buy theater tickets, and who runs theater institutions. Um, and I would also add, I, I was intrigued by your comment about affixing portrayals in time and in the past, and how that resonates with ideas of Orientalism, which so often imagines Asia as this mythical place stuck in the past that is unchanging, that's static, um, and therefore how, um, again, reproducing the Mikado, a operetta that's more than 100 years old, as well as Anything Goes, and we talked about the King and I, um, how that, again, that reproduces a fixing in the past without change. And um, yeah, and so we need to change, obviously, what those culture productions are that get on stage, but also I think, um, because <laughs> we're bringing the Academy in here, about which shows are taught um, in class and how, um, and even if you do teach canonical text, to teach them with a critical lens as opposed to one uh, simply reifying and celebrating it as, as mere representation, as mere visibility politics. Um, yeah, do you have anything to add, Seba or Chris? There's a thunderstorm happening here, so I have to keep killing my mic. I think uh, one has to work I, I really appreciated what you said Don Jello, about the uh, you know the working past the pleasure and the experience that one has the, the questions and the challenges that come up um, so my my process has really been to um, redefine for myself 
those what is literature what is art and and celebrate for myself as opposed and that is why in many ways i've resisted the canon because every time i enter the academic sphere unless it's um defined by myself like right now i'm teaching a class called art as activism so my co um professor and myself are choosing all the texts and all the art that we're presenting to the students and that makes it okay that that is tolerable but if we look at existing um structures we won't find it unless we find others like-minded um colleagues across the world really um i'm interested actually in this is actually for donatella as well um, can you use the mic i cannot hear you oh sorry um the Anything goes in this revision, as far as, because um, I also saw the 2011 uh, revival, which was using the script that they had used for the previous Broadway revival, um, but as I was mentioning to you last night in the cab, uh, I was, my, my first role in high school was as Ling in Anything Goes, <laughs> um, and where I wore a little field worker's hat and moved it with a little mincing gait and, and, and whatnot. And so what, what I was interested in when I went to see the production was because I, I knew that they had supposedly fixed it racially, uh, and then how much was really not. And, and, and the idea that um, they were, obviously doing it to address the concerns, but doing as little as possible to actually do so. And I was wondering if you can talk just a little, maybe a little more specifically about exactly what changed and what stayed the same between the original script of Anything Goes and the, the revival, and like who they actually talked to in order to, if, if you know, like to make this okay, as far as like, like how, how did they actually decide how they were going to make this less offensive? <laughs> That's an excellent question and another paper, but I will give you the highlights. Uh, so you're right, they used the libretto that was revised by, principally by John Whiteman for the 1980s production at Lincoln Center, and then they um, made a couple more changes. The major ones from the 1934 libretto, um, and by the way, that doesn't exist. We have to use the 35 one from the London production. And um, mostly they, the, for, first of all, the original actors were Asian actors in the original Broadway production, uh, which is interesting. And they, the text has them speaking in a particular kind of pigeon that is more Americanized in the newer versions of the play. And largely they were put there because the actor, um, the leading actor Gaxton was known for his yellow face performances. So I'm convinced that those characters were there so that then in the end he could take their clothes and don yellow face, which was supposedly hilarious. And they are not even really crucial to the script and the ending and the resolution of the marriages. That's something that John Whiteman added, actually. And the plot, just so you know, of Anything Goes is that the effeminized British Sir Evelyn is paired with Hope, the white ingenue, and they're clearly not supposed to be together. Um, and part of that is because Sir Evelyn has slept with a Chinese woman, so that has made him impure. And in the revival, he sings The Gypsy in Me, which um, you know essentializes the Roma. And originally, that song was not his. So again, there's this other ring of Sir Evelyn. And the idea of the yellow face is that they dress up also as the woman he slept with and claim that they had a baby together. So that's what breaks up that marriage in order to restore the correct marriages at the end. So that switch, like making the yellow face necessary for the plot resolution is actually a new addition. So that's interesting to me that that um, is so necessary as opposed to they could have done something else in the 1980s revision. Um, and then secondly, I would say to make it less offensive in the newer production, I think they tried to humanize John and Luke slash Ching and Ling a little bit more, and they made it clear that one character was much more straight edge than the other one. And they, it suggested, you know, that they're addicted to gambling and to alcohol, but not as much this time. They have, <laughs> uh, they have some better punchlines, which is great. And at the very end of the show, which I think is absolutely key, is so they've had their clothes taken from them. They get to put on the tuxedos of the white male characters, and we see them in the very last stage image 
they don't talk, they're so far upstage and literally on top of the structure, but we do get to see them one last time in full tuxedos and they look so happy. And it actually reminds me in some ways of the ending of like Thoroughly Modern Millie too, like that last like American assimilationist move and this is supposed to be a happy ending. Uh, hi, I have a few questions. Um, a, a small point on the yellow face thing. I noticed that for you, is the act of a white character disguising themselves, is that actually s the same thing to you as a white actor playing a distinctly Asian character on stage? To me, they may not be the same thing, but I notice you're using yellow face for, for both. We could get into a d discussion of comedy tropes and why, from Weidman's point of view, making it necessary is better writing rather than uh, inferior writing in terms of talent. I also wanted to react to uh, uh, what Rob was saying. Um, um, I'm not mixed race, but I'm from southern Illinois, went to British school in Hong Kong, went to Berkeley, and then I'm in LA. My brother lives in New Zealand, and he's raising a Kiwi daughter, and my parents are in Taipei, which means between the four of us, we triangulate the whole Pacific Ocean. Um, my brother calls me Asian American because of the sort of more political kinds of ways that I talk. He calls himself a global citizen. And I realized, you know what? That's something most of us, any of us, could embrace whatever background, and that is a home. Not only is it home, it's a very clear wave of the future. Building off of that, I want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, global consciousness, which gets used a lot these days, but most people use it as marketing, which is BS. Um, to me, what global consciousness and how much of it is in different stories or narratives or narratives to come is a really, really vital and interesting thing about the future because traditional dramaturgy, you know, it's often, okay, one family has to stand in for the whole human race and that's an easier way to write, right, because of the way drama works. But more and more I think those stories are inadequate to our narrative needs dealing with the way the world is going. So that means we're going to have writers and in fact we should encourage writers to figure out, okay, if politically we believe in this sort of global consciousness and by that means that there are certain humanist principles that have to underlie all our work, right, on some level and we're responsible for it. So therefore the comfort and discomfort we cause as artists, whether we intended it or not, we're still responsible. And then how is that reflected in our work? So then how writers are going to capture that in the future is very interesting to me. And I think that's a, uh, a discussion I would love to have with more people. Since we have academics in the room, I'm also curious whether you feel there are already texts that I may or may not know about that already approach that or succeed uh, uh, in doing that. So I throw that question out there. Or we have to call it into being. Do you know what I'm saying? It's a slightly different kind of dramaturgy even than the, than the traditional perhaps. There are filmmakers who try to do this as well to varying degrees of success that I think are also worth uh, talking about. But going back to that point, global citizen is a great identity. Do you know what I mean? Because I hear folks talk about, oh, I'm caught in between and all that. And all of that is true. But you're also privileged. Or uh, I don't mean you. We are also privileged in that way. Is that in that one action, my brother, it's like he has a super glamorous life. He's an academic. He's in Europe. He's there. His daughter's going to speak three languages, you know, because she's also half Filipino. It's, it's a, uh, uh, a very viable, I think, uh, and powerful identity for what's to come. I, I I agree with you, and I think that the one of the very difficult things for us as like academics or like cultural producers to navigate the divide is like how how our work is valued in a way, right? And what brings people um, into the venue, the room to hear what we say. And I'm very much of the I'm very much a proponent of like using all of these different types of language of global consciousness, et cetera, which can be really used toward very fucked up ways and then getting them into a room and then messing with it, right? So like, okay, so global, you might think that global citizenship or like consciousness as an audience member is to come in and to think about like how we look at like a very wealthy like metropolitan um, Singapore and like um, transnationals going around buying everything, right? The crazy rich Asians from Kevin Kwong. And then coming in and saying like, well, let's actually look at the very, 
very real different types of fractures and divide, right? And also thinking about how race and Asian American mean something pr very particular where it is both simultaneously global but has very, manifest in very local ways and has a lot of fraught histories. Um, and I think that we could also, this was, had another point. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. sure. Yeah, I'm with you, Chris. And I think uh, part of what we're getting at here actually really resonates with what uh, Sabah was saying in her talk, again, about borderlines and um, various global issues. And I loved how she intertwined seemingly disparate issues like nationalism with drones and which, with critiques of patriarchy as well, uh, which are demands that uh, we need to criticize if we're going to claim titles of global citizen and not just be cosmopolitan. Um, so I think that distinction is important. And then to address your point about uh, comedy tropes and the necessity of the yellow face, I see what you're saying about the, the differences and I use the umbrella of yellow face, which I think we should actually employ as a much larger category beyond like putting yellow on your face, for instance. But I see that I think what you're insinuating is when there are productions in which there's a conscious putting on of the yellow face, like we get to see it and it's part of the narrative, that's very different from a not reflected upon um, production in which it just happens from the start. Um, and so I do think there is a distinction there. And there is always the possibility of when it is a metatheatrical production that it draws attention to the very performativity of race, that it shows us that it's social construction and therefore it can be changed. And I think that's very productive. But on the other hand, I don't wanna see any yellow face, especially when people are so happy around me seeing it. And I just feel horrible. And then when also nobody talks about it, um, except for us here and we meet only every couple of years or you know on Facebook or whatever. Um, so that's, uh, but I agree that there is a distinction there. Are there any other questions? I have one for Chris, if I was you're just going to comment. Oh. I was just going to comment that, you know, one of the comforts that I find is in the term transnational, so then I don't have to claim one place or the other, and I can not, it, it, it's, it's a comforting, if you're going to take a label, that's one that fits a little bit better, because when, I at least move between spaces and I don't have the nationalism to either space. I don't, you know, and I think that, but I, but invariably, no matter where I go, in this country at least, people say, where are you from? You know, and I think that um, some, one of you talked, brought up the issue of clothing, the choice of clothing and how, um, what that ends up meaning. And, and somebody asked me, why did I choose to wear a sari for that TEDx? And, you know, for me, that is reclaiming my history, actually. But I also understand that it can be viewed as, it can be orientalized, exoticized, and it, it's a very complicated issue of what identity is. Um, the most important thing, I think, is to talk about it and not be afraid of those really difficult subjects. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out. I think it's also really important to recognize what was talked about earlier about about films where white characters are playing um, non-white characters like Ben Kingsley and um, Gandhi, and then to watch movies like Not Without My Daughter and see how, in general, that kind of mentality is is presented to the wider audience, and there's very little consciousness of what that actually means to have. Um, those, those, those kinds of conflicts presented to viewer, to audience members, and there's no analysis. Yeah. Um, I had, I had. Uh, oh, hello. Uh, <laughs> I had uh, actually one question for uh, Seba, which was about. Uh, the group that you were addressing in there, like what was the context for that talk? Um, and I'm trying to weave these things all together actually in response to your comment about global citizenship. And I'm sorry, actually maybe you brought it up. I'm sorry, it's in the bathroom. But um, um, the idea of global citizenship, I think, and transnationalism, I think are really interesting and productive. But uh, I guess part of uh, my attraction to those terms is more, more because they open up the possibility of not knowing, right? 
I'm not a global citizen because we're all the same. I'm, you know, I'm a global citizen in the sense that there's a whole world, and I, I guess I'd, part of my question is towards is for Seba, like your concept of global citizenship or the kind of dispersed home that you were talking about seemed more, well, I mean, I'm not trying to oppose them, but it just, it, but part of what seemed interesting to me about it is there are whole worlds that I don't know, and that's okay, right? There is a way of being in the world that is on the other side of the globe that I'm connected to, but that I, I can't claim that we're all the same, and that's, and that's okay. It's, it's more about like making it okay to not be accountable for and owning you know, everything and homogenizing everything, but actually having that kind of sense of the unknowable and the different, the radically different and yet connected uh, membership in some sort of, I don't know, uh, community that is really dispersed in that way. I'm not making sense, I'm sorry, but I guess I just wanna like put a little pressure on the, the term global or transnational because there are different ways to understand it. There's one in which it's like, yes, we're all the same. And then there's another which is, yes, we are impossibly different and that's okay, right? Um, and so I'd be sort of curious to know like how you experience that and how you, know, you have a certain experience of it that's personal. Um, so that's one thing, I'm sorry, that was a really bad question, but I'm, anyway. Uh, but the second one is about pleasure and displeasure. Um, and I, just to go back to Sal Ling's thing about necessity and extravagance, and I guess I wanna say this in a group of people who are practicing artists, I wanna make a pitch for extravagance, <laughs> right? For extravagance's sake, because I feel like, at least in my uh, kind of academic position in the arts, I find that we are often having to justify the kind of art that, y that you guys do in this sort of political functionalist way. This is necessary, right? This is, here's the kind of, uh, the, the political project, the agenda, that this is why we must do this and this is why you must listen to us. And I'm, I, you know, I find myself in my own job trying to turn that on its head to say, isn't there something about just purely gratuitous, weird, pleasurable art that makes us human, that, that is worth doing, not because we can justify it for a particular political project, but because that, I mean, I, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm worried that, that especially kind of race-specific art or community-specific art always has to justify itself in terms of some kind of anthropological explanation, uh, which I find that other artists don't have to do, right? They can just be beautiful or it can just be weird. And um, so I guess I'm, I'm trying to, I, I realize it's a very naive thing and I'm speaking as a tenured professor so I don't have to make a living doing that, but I guess I, I, I'm, this is my little one woman project to like make people just do weird art and, and, and not have to justify it, right? Um, so anyway, so, but I did have a, a real question for Seba about the context of the talk that you were giving and how it was received. For me, I don't claim to be a global citizen. It's really more about transnationalism, knowing one country, one city, really, really, knowing two cities on opposite sides of the world really well. Um, and that helps me recognize issues in other places, but by no means can I say that I know what it means to be on the Gaza Strip right now um, or to be on the Bangladesh border trying to cross over into India and have guns aimed at you. So I, ju I just think, and you know, it can get very specific and that is why my work has always been very localized then. It, you have to take it to the very, very local issues. Um, so that's really what that term means for me more. It's not about claiming one place. It's just saying there's more than one place. Let me be honest about that. Um, because Asian American does not fit me. So if you're going to put a label, and Pakistani does not fit me. So what am I then? Where does that go? People invariably there's a label, and I would love to shed it altogether and just be, as you said, with that notion of pleasure or expression and not have a message. So that's a very, very valid point too about art just for maybe are you saying art just for art's sake or which is uh, I think it's fine. I don't think that there's an issue. I don't think that one should always have one, one should have message in one's work i think what one what comes out from the work that i do is just what is on my mind at a particular moment and it could be the orchids that are blooming and are about to die and i don't know how to take care of them because i don't have time i, I think it's very but, but invariably whatever i produce will be interpreted through that through that lens of well you are this and therefore your work what does it represent right so um, 
I was just talking to a friend of mine who is Palestinian, who's a Palestinian poet, and he was talking about how he is also trying to just shed it and just be a poet. Like, what does it mean to just say, I'm an artist, and not have a label attached? Did I, answer, did, I, did I get to your question, Donatello? Yes. Yes, that was great. Thank you. W one thing that I, uh, I didn't mention when I was making my comment before is that, you know, having had this kind of experience between countries and cultures, I simultaneously feel at home. And I do feel uh, like I can exist, like I can manage. I have agency between borders um, just because of the variety of experiences that I've had to live through and because of the cultures and languages that I've had to adapt to. Um, so in that sense, you know, I, I like this idea of transnational, um, global citizen, I, I do ascribe to slightly, but I think that more appropriately it would be third culture. Because for me, especially with strong roots in my Japanese side, um, and certainly in my American side, you know, I'm torn between those two cultures. And I guess throwing in other nations in between that, you get pulled in different directions, so maybe it's fourth or fifth culture after a while. But the point is, you are simultaneously belonging to them and, and something other than that. So kind of bringing it back to the art side, how do we as artists convey that to people who have not had those experiences? And I think that that's the most challenging thing. Because when we're in a room full of Asian Americans, or when we're in a room of people of color, we can identify, certainly amongst Asian Americans, but on a broader scale, people of color have all been marginalized in our society. So there are commonalities that people can relate to. However, when you start to look at that kind of mainstream theater audience, predominantly we still do have the patronage and we still do have this kind of funding system that is deeply rooted in this kind of mainstream white American culture. And this is a culture that, from my experience growing up in suburban Connecticut, is nowhere near uh, acculturated to this idea of sharing culture, of being a third culture. So how do we integrate that into our work in a way that is uh, manageable and navigable by these people who are not familiar with these concepts? I think, I think specificity and speaking from, just I guess in, in response to that, specificity and speaking from your own experience just totally authentically and honestly is what's really powerful in drawing people into how you would work that into your art. You know, like I, I'd be so interested to hear your story and your journey in terms of how you came to identifying how you do. I think that, and then there's also assumption. I think that, you know, we all look at each other and then we're gonna assume certain things. I think um, I probably look very Japanese American. You know, but there, you know, just because I'm so-called 100% Japanese by blood doesn't mean that I'm not full of diversity and like belong to so many different communities and identities, but there's a process in getting there, right? And I, I don't know, I'm a big fan of difference and, and, and we're totally different. We're so not the same, we're just not. And so I think that, you know, being specific is that thus where then we find connection, if not same, you know, what, what's the saying, the Lakota saying? Oneness, not sameness, you know, so. Um, and just to echo on that, I mean, I don't have the answer for that, but I think that is the artistic challenge, you know what I mean? And, and I don't know, it's a rich opportunity and we just have to create and keep trying to find ways of doing that. Um, and I think what you were saying about extravagance, I, I do think the challenge for Asian American artists, it, it's funny because I uh, read scripts at a regional theater and they, they were both like, we're totally open. And then when an Asian American play would come in, they're like, well, it's probably gonna be about an Asian family where someone dies and there's a ghost. And I was like, nine times out of 10, it was that, you know what I mean? Which is, you know, but it's like, f so but then they kind of were like, we're both open and then we're not against the stereotype. And it was also that I was encouraging Asian American artists to, to just write your stories and think on a broader canvas. And it's okay if you wanna write just a comedy or just a farce, or you wanna write something, you know what I mean? That don't feel compelled to, 
sometimes the social action isn't just telling your story, you know what I mean? And it doesn't have to feel like it has to have that weight. And I think the trend is that in this day and age, everyone wears multiple hats, no matter who you are. So just saying a white person doesn't mean because there's sexuality, there's class, there's, there's so many different things. So everyone is experiencing that and going to experience that. And there's community in our isolation in that way of, that, of not feeling like you belong anywhere and everywhere. Um, and so I think those are the kind of the next generation of artistic questions that we have to fight. And maybe it's also the ways that we are telling those stories and the structures that allow those, you know what I mean? So maybe it's a different type of experience of storytelling, um, you know, for something on a proscenium stage that's naturalistic that we have to figure out. Thanks so much for that beautiful comment, and it, um, it strikes the chord with something I've been thinking lately, and that came up quite, quite often um, during the conversations these few days, is like thinking about what Asian American means, but also thinking about what race means when it enters conversations about cultural productions and arts, because oftentimes, sometimes I would hear from performers or artists, it's like, oh, I am very intent on not performing as an Asian American art artist, or like, oh, I want this to be, something else besides identity or whatever. And I think that oftentimes um, race or Asian American is perceived as to be like the closing door for creativity, right? It's like, oh, this is just about race, this is just about Asian American. But I would encourage us to, um, along with what Karen is suggesting, what you're suggesting is actually to take it up and say like, no, this thing that seems like it has nothing whatsoever to do with Asian American is Asian American. And Asian American and race are actually opening doors for um, their invitations for something much more imaginative and creative. It feels like the work in which you just in Asian Right, I think one of the major themes today has been about multiplicity of homes, but also be, not, not having a home and that productive tension between both of those. And getting back to an earlier question about various cultural productions and homes, I've been thinking of um, a couple folks like Young Jean Lee, who just writes all sorts of different plays and is not like necessarily in an Asian American box. Um, and her next play is called Straight White Men, right? Um, I wanted to mention Allegiance, the musical, um, and that I think productively will deal with home, but then the question is, will it come to Broadway? And now its marketing is like, a family you'll come to love, a story you've never heard. And the you <laughs> implies that you don't know about Japanese American internment. Um, so I think that's interesting. Um, and then briefly again, as a um, mixed person, the only play I have ever seen about a mixed Asian and white person was this off, 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 off Broadway show called Asian Bell. Um, and that was empowering and seeing a mixed race actress, Mana Nichols in the lead role in My Fair Lady at Arena Stage was um, such an inspiring moment in my life to see for the first time someone who looked like me on stage in a leading part. Um, and then finally, I was going to mention American Hwanga by Lloyd Su. And uh, part of like what he accomplished was that was a rolling world premiere. So again, that can help to build the canon if you have multiple productions, but you have to like network with these various regional theaters in order to get that done. So I just, I just wanted to address what you were saying about um, the extravagance of, of, of theater that you feel is missing from, from Asian America and, and doing art for art's sake, right? Is, is that... Worried about the ways we have to, have to make ourselves legible and to, to justify ourselves and to, to even be on the scene. Right. Oh, yeah. Well, okay. So that's that's the point that I was going to make is that none of us would be doing it if we weren't passionate about the art, and then and you know. So that I think that's there. But I think a lot of times, especially in my market, we are prevented from doing it. it it's just it, it's just not acceptable. Yeah. People people won't do it unless we create it ourselves. Yeah. And so we do have to bring some of those stories for our audience. Yeah. Um, I just want to say, as as an observer of the Mai. Theater Writers Lab, uh, which is mostly uh, thirty something to forty something Asian American playwrights, second, third generation writers, they don't concern themselves about being Asian American. They write about themes that interest them, whether it be like I had said, you know, I, 
children going into outer space because that's what somebody wants to write about, or about a French mathematician that's caught in a love triangle during the French Revolution, uh, written by a Korean American, or whether it's about what uh, microfinance or, or Jesus going to India, uh, it doesn't have to do uh, with with uh, racial issues or with uh, uh, content or, or uh, issues of discrimination, alienation, and, and bigotry. I think the new Asian American playwright has gone beyond that, uh, thankfully, and uh, they're not writing what their grandparents would have written about had they, be, you know, they're, they're no longer first generation immigrants and they are not caught in that trap of uh, writing about their non-assimilation, thankfully. Yeah, I mean, actually, I didn't mean to suggest that the artists aren't doing this, but I feel like it's a way, I don't know, maybe it's, um, this is how I, I'm an academic, and I don't actually know how these things happen, but it's a, it's a matter of, what, educating literary managers or, you know, artistic directors, that, that if, if that's the argument that we keep having to make to get into the rotation, right, then that to me is the problem, right? It's like, I, I don't know how to change that, but I feel like for, you know, we keep having to come back and make these arguments about social justice and blah, 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 and not on artistic merit when there's plenty of material that could actually be produced and based on artistic merit, you know what I mean? Or just the weirdness of it. And in terms of the kinds of texts that somebody was asking about, what sort of texts, I didn't know if you were asking about academic texts or dramatic texts, but I mean, for me, I think what I would love to see produced, and then again, it's not, I know that they're being written, it's just frustrating that they don't get produced as often as I'd like to see, are just texts of all kinds, not necessarily just by uh, people of color, but texts that kind of destabilize everybody. Maybe it's my own personal <laughs> aesthetic taste, but I feel like for my role as, a, as an educator, part of what I'm trying to do is educate audiences to take pleasure in being uncertain, or take pleasure in in being confused or to take pleasure in not looking for that satisfying resolution where it ended the way I thought it was going to end, right? That, that to me, that's more, that's the bigger project is getting people to understand that you can take pleasure in not having your worldview confirmed. Um, and so that's not necessarily just about race. It's more like an aesthetic education of audiences, right? That it's okay to be confused and to find that fun, right? Um, I don't know. So that's my job, that's not your job, so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, I let's... I think it's just oh. very important to keep creating work that has integrity and not, and yes, absolutely not to have to justify it on the basis of this is who I am and this is what I must say because of who I am, but to, to, be, in, to be honest with oneself when creating work and not creating it for audience. Um, because this is what this is what is required of somebody like myself. So I think if 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 as artists we have integrity, then we don't have to justify and we don't have to contextualize and we don't have to explain. We can just do the work and resist being pushed into corners and being labeled and being um, and having our word, work analyzed through certain kinds of lenses. And that's really. What, what my commitment to the creating work is to resist that resist that um, th that demand of this is where you come from and this is what we expect from you. You will shed light, and that is not my story because my story of growing up in the kind of home that I did in Karachi is not the story that that I share with many other. It is, it is my unique story, and as somebody in the audience just said, everybody has a story and multiplicity of experiences, and as long as we are honest with that, I think that um, we, we can push our work. Well, thank you. On that deconstructive note of contesting terms, let's end our panel. I want to thank, once again, our panelists and wonderful audience for coming. Thank you so much. Asian Arts Initiative. I'm really, really impressed and sorry I couldn't be there. Thank you for including me. <laughs>